So my name is Suzanne Teller from the Lucky New Watershed Council. I'm the outreach coordinator. I would uh, welcome all of you to tonight's citizen science event. It's our uh, second one of the year. We are um, we are also oh, also with us tonight is Kendra Callahan. She is our question and answer moderator. She's our outreach assistant for the Lucky New Watershed Council. Thank you, Kendra, for being here. And I'll explain more about how we're going to do our questions and answers in a moment. And of course, I also want to welcome Troy Tate here uh, tonight. He's with the Oregon Black Pioneers. Here's our speaker, and we're very honored to have him here with us tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so, and next, I'd also like to take a moment to thank our friends of the Lucky Watershed Council and our business circle members for helping to provide the funding for this event. We are so grateful for their support and for the support of all of our donors and volunteers who help make our Love Your Watershed program possible. As a uh, Watershed Council, we work with many different community partners, organizations, schools, agencies, and landowners of all types to protect, restore, and enhance the rivers and lands of the Lucky Newt and Ash Creek watershed. And uh, in addition to the on-the-ground on restoration and monitoring programs we do, uh, the Lucky Newt Watershed Council works hard to build stronger connections between people and place. So our Love Your Watershed program um, provides opportunities like this to learn more about not only the local rivers, landscapes, plants, and animals of our watershed, but also our human communities, um, as well as how to take action to protect and restore their health and build stronger connections among um, all members of the watershed, human and uh, non-human alike. For 2021 and 2022, our theme for the Love Your Watershed program is exploring the history of our watershed. So much of our local history has been ignored, overlooked, or even deleted from our history books and what gets taught in our school. So part of the emphasis on history this year and next year as well will be to tell some of these important stories, including those of the tribes, Latinos, Blacks, and other people of color, all of whom are part of the larger story of our watershed our state, and our nation as a whole. Before I turn it over to Troy, I would like to acknowledge the first peoples of our watershed, the Kalapuya. The primary bands of Kalapuya in our watershed service area are the Lucky Mute, the Yamhill, and the Chapinapa, who have lived here for over 14,000 years. Their stories involve uh, many millennia of knowledge, of knowledge of and relationship with the land, the injustice and the hardships of being forcibly removed from their homelands in 1855, as well as their ongoing resilience, engagement, and contributions as part, part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Silet Indians. I encourage you to dig deeper and learn more about the tribes that exist in the places that you live and work in, and I've provided two resources here on this slide that can help you do that. Um, and I can put those in the chat box as well, if you'd like. And um, in a little while, I'll do that. So it's now time to move into the main event and bring you our speaker for the evening, Troy Tate. The stories Troy will share this evening will be about the determination and strength of early Black pioneers and settlers as they fought unimaginable challenges to gain their freedom from slavery, and then went on to make enormous enormous contributions to the history of our region and our communities. So, oops, sorry. <laughs> so without further ado, <laughs> Troy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And let me stop my share and allow you to do that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne and Kendra and the Lucky Amute Watershed uh, Council for giving us the Oregon Black Pioneers an opportunity uh, to speak about the history of Blacks in Oregon. Uh, some of the things that we'll be discussing tonight, um, you may know, you may not know. Uh, and so we're going to do our best to try to uh, give you some historical information um, about uh, Blacks entering into the territory and the state of Oregon, um, as well as some uh, information and some stories that's specific uh, to the watershed area. Uh, specifically uh, the Benton, Lynn, and Lincoln. 
Lincoln County. Um, <clears throat> and so some of these stories um, are very fascinating uh, and they tell a very good history um, about Blacks in the region. Uh, but some of the stories may be uncomfortable um, for you to hear uh, because we as Northerners do not associate ourselves with some of the history uh, that we are familiar with as it pertains to slavery, um, and exclusion, and harsh treatment of Blacks. Uh, but across the country, um, there are stories like the ones that I will share tonight about individuals who wanted to expand West um, that were formerly slaves um, or Negro or colored, um, as we'll use uh, some of that historical language tonight in our discussion, uh, and the, some of the treatment that they faced. Um, <clears throat> but as Suzanne uh, kind of pointed out, uh, these stories are of, of perseverance uh, and dealing with difficult things, but nevertheless uh, pursuing their own kind of destiny, if you will, kind of manifesting destiny um, for these individuals um, in a way that is not necessarily talked about when we think of things like the Oregon Trail um, or Oregon history in general. Uh, so, uh, you know, please, if you have questions, uh, Kendra is going to uh, ask those questions. Uh, so feel free to put them into the chat uh, box uh, and we'll just try to move right along uh, as well as possible to share some of these stories. Uh, so just provide me a little bit of levity. Um, I'm a visual learner um, and so I do have uh, a PowerPoint presentation that I will show to you today that will have some information, historical documents as well as some photos of the individuals that I'll be talking about. I also have a video to share uh, to talk about um, a story that was Letitia Carson's story. Um, because we are a historical organization, we have relationships with other historical organizations. Um, and there are two that I will mention uh, in my uh, presentation this evening. One is the Lynn Benton County Historical Museum, uh, which I've been to in Brownsville. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll make some references to a couple of things there. Um, and also the High Desert Museum, um, which is in the Bend area. Um, and they were the ones that created this video uh, for the Letitia Carson story. And so I want to highlight them and talk about them and um, ultimately kind of encourage you to visit a few of these places, uh, specifically the Lynn Benton County Historical Museum there in Brownsville. Um, <clears throat> there's a story, uh, the Corcock story, which I'll talk about tonight. Um, and uh, there's some information exhibits there and photos at the Lynn Benton County Museum um, and the Amanda Gardner story, which I will not speak of tonight, but you can find more information there. And then an individual by the name of Minor Jackson, um, there's an exhibit uh, highlighting him there. He was a barber that lived in the Brownsville area um, in the early, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, and when I went to Brownsville to participate in their kind of living history um, exhibit, um, I think it was in the August of 2019, uh, I dressed up as Minor Jackson and uh, did some uh, kind of information about him and the things that he did there in Brownsville um, and some other historical figures that were in the region. And so I certainly would encourage you uh, to go and visit uh, those museums. So having said that, let me go ahead and kind of jump into my presentation. And I'm sorry, just right before you start. Oh, sorry, Susanna. I'm sure we're on the same page here. I just wanted to say, if you do have questions as Troy's going along, just to clarify, you'll want to use the Q&A to put those in there. And when there's a break, a little bit of a break, I'll just, uh, I'll ask the questions as we go along. Um, but if I don't ask them immediately, be patient. I'll, I will get to them just when Troy has a break in his talking. I'll, I'll interrupt him and I'll ask. Yeah, feel, I was <laughs> going to say, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, not that I just want to keep going and going, but, you know, sometimes when you're telling the story, you just kind of go. Yeah, yeah. I will. I'll, I'll do it as they come in. So thank okay. you. Wonderful. And thank then uh, for those of you that are watching along, um, I do have some things to read. Uh, so if I'm kind of looking away from the screen, I'm kind of reading from my script. Um, as a historical organization, there is factual information um, that we want to present to you, um, and I want to make sure that it's accurate. And so uh, there is some scripts that I'll read from, and then there'll be times where I'm looking directly at the screen uh, just to kind of speak, uh, to give my opinion or some information um, that I think is pertinent to the story. Um, so thank you again for giving us this opportunity to make this presentation. 
So the first thing that I want to do is kind of set the tone. Uh, whenever we talk historically um, about uh, African Americans, Black, uh, whichever kind of phrasing that you use at this particular time um, across the history of our country, there's been a lot of different terms that have been used to describe, uh, you know, those that were enslaved and brought to this country. Um, and so I may interchangeably use phrases uh, like Negro, uh, colored, um, or even talk about those that are enslaved and in slavery or refer to them as property. Uh, because that's how they were referred at that time. Um, and it just provides the historical context so that you can understand why some of the things happened in the way in which they did um, as it pertains to these stories that I'm going to share with you today. Um, so the customs, the laws, and the language are all different. Um, it may be unfamiliar, it may be uncomfortable um, for you to hear me talk about people this way. It's, it, at times it's even uncomfortable for me, but uh, this is the history that we must discuss and talk about and talk about it candidly and in the way in which it happened at the time in which it occurred. Um, however, these stories will demonstrate great perseverance, strength, and integrity. Uh, before I get started with some of those stories, there is just some general history that I want to share. Uh, and so Marcus Lopez is an individual that I want to kind of talk about a little bit. Actually, before I get to that, um, I want to read this. Um, a Peculiar Paradise, A History of Blacks in Oregon from 1788 to 1940, written by Elizabeth McLagan, describes Oregon for Blacks in this way. A Peculiar Paradise is an apt description for early African-American experiences in the state. From the beginning of white settlement, there was ample and open hostility towards Blacks. But compared to the horrific conditions slaves were enduring in the South, Oregon was indeed a relative paradise. Virtually all the stories that we discuss today will outline in some way the hostility, resentment, or dislike for Blacks in the region. However, the Blacks who made it here showed the resilience, class, and tenacity to be successful in a new world. In addition to the racism, in addition to racism, the West still needed to be tamed, and these Blacks led the way in their spaces, professions, and in the community commitment in a way that all of us should find inspirational. <clears throat> the people of this time navigated life as best they could at the time. Many of the people were not only pioneers in coming to the Western frontier, but also in challenging of laws, creating new customs, and creating new lenses for us to live and benefit from now. These stories, although hard to hear or imagine, show great strength, perseverance, and diligence. It may be uneasy to hear how laws were created to create barriers for Blacks at the time, but these stories demonstrate the tenacity of those who will not be deterred despite these laws, rules, and customs. So the first person that I'm going to discuss tonight is Marcus Lopez. Um, and he can be candidly referred to as the first known Oregonian of African descent. Uh, Black history on the Oregon coast begins with bloodshed. The first known person of African descent to set foot on Oregon coast soil is Marcus Lopez of Africa's uh, Cape Verde Island, who accompanied Captain Robert Gray as a servant on his journey by sloop in 1788. According to the ship's log, Gray ordered the Lady Washington into what we refer to these days as Tillamook Bay. The Tillamook Indians greeted the crew warmly, offered food, and even dancing for them. Later, however, a dispute with Lopez and some of the Tillamook Indians responded in Lopez claiming that the Indians had stole his horse. According to the ship's log, he confronted the local Native Americans and a scuffle ensued. Lopez was stabbed and abandoned by Gray and the company, who killed at least one of the Tillamook Indians before fleeing to their ship and setting sail. Gray later named the harbor Murderer's Bay to commemorate the grim occasion of Marcus Lopez's death. The next person that I'm going to talk to you about is a Negro by the name of York. He was a slave that was along the Lewis and Clark expedition. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and he was owned by William Clark. York was William Clark's slave and an integral member of the Lewis and Clark expedition sent by President Thomas Jefferson to explore the Louisiana Territory and the Oregon country in 1804 through 1806. 
The written description of York display him as a large, dark, strong, and agile. His date of birth is unknown, but his parents were owned by William Clark's father, and as a young child, York had been assigned as the companion and later manservant to Clark. In traditions of the Southern slavery, that usually meant that they were about the same age, which means York was probably born in about 1770. Journal entry and oral traditions note that Native people were impressed by York and that his presence operated as a valuable element in the expedition's diplomatic interactions with those they encountered. On October 9, 1804, the expedition member, Sergeant John Ordway, recorded this in his journal. The greatest curiosity to them was York, Captain Clark's black man. All the nation made a great deal of him. York's contributions also included hunting, medical services, physical labor, and participation in special exploratory activities. During the difficult days of the return trip, when expedition members were near starvation, York was entrusted with the critical task of trading their few remaining valuables with the natives for desperately needed provisions, ensuring the expedition's survival. Clark eventually granted York his freedom in about 1816, approximately 10 years after the expedition's return to St. Louis. York's final fate is clouded in mystery. One version, offered by Clark, claims that York grew to hate his freedom and died in Tennessee while trying to return to his old master. Another version, based on a description by an 1830s mountain man named Dennis Leonard, has York living out an honored life as a crow, as a crow Indian chief in the West. There is no conclusive evidence to support either version. However, what is important is that York was an integral part of the Lewis and Clark expedition and that the expedition would not have been successful without his participation. Now we'll move on to talking a little bit about traveling the Oregon Trail. What's interesting about uh, our thoughts on the Oregon Trail, specifically for those of us that are Oregonians, um, is that when we think of Oregon Trail travelers, we do not think of Negroes or Blacks traveling the Oregon Trail as well, but they did. Some, very few traveled as free persons. Most of them traveled um, as property or slaves of whites that were traveling west. So a few of the stories that I'm going to tell you in just a few moments are about some of those individuals. Now, what needs to be known and stated about this is that many of them traveled to Oregon when it was still a territory before it received statehood status. And the territory was not accepting of Blacks. They had exclusion laws which prevented Blacks from owning residence uh, or owning property and taking up residence in the territory. And as we'll see here in just a moment, Oregon is one of the few states that actually had exclusion laws in its uh, constitution when it was accepted into statehood in 1852. <clears throat> As we began to look more specifically at the Negroes traveling west into the new frontier, they were traveling into a new place that was welcoming to new arrivals, but not to Negroes. Prior to Oregon becoming a state, laws prevented Negroes from settling into the region. There was economic anxiety as well as racist overtones to their exclusion. First, white immigrants did not want to have to compete with cheap slave labor. Coming from areas where these poor whites had to compete with free slave labor was not something they wanted to compete with in the New West. In addition, it was believed that free and enslaved Negroes would join with the native Indians of the area and the combined forces could attack, kill, or overthrow the migrating settlers. These two thoughts, combined with an overall prejudice against Blacks, led to the amendments excluding Blacks from the Oregon Territory. These laws were included in the first constitution of the state, which was submitted with its acceptance into the Union. Oregon is the only state to have been given statehood with these types of laws on the record. They were not officially repealed until 1926. This meant that all Negroes entering Oregon could not be enslaved. However, they could not have legal residence and were given up to three years to leave 
with a threat of whipping every six months if they did not vacate. There is only one case of someone actually being excluded based on these exclusion laws. Jacob Vanderpool was arrested on August 20th, 1851, and within a week he was tried and convicted of breaking the 1849 exclusion law. The reality is that this was a way to eliminate competitive Negro businesses as Mr. Vanderpool owned a saloon, restaurant, and boarding house in Oregon City. There are other examples of whites trying to exclude blacks based on these exclusion laws, but these cases either were unsuccessful or the Negroes left before a hearing. One of the families, one family, Abner Francis, was tried to be excluded. He petitioned his friends and got over 200 signatures to prevent his exclusion. He also shared letters with a prominent abolitionist Frederick Douglass, and was instrumental in helping to bring attention to the treatment of Negroes in the West. So as you can see here, there were a uh, the provisional government uh, in the Oregon Territory before Oregon became a state. And that provisional government did not allow slavery. They declared it illegal, but it also excluded Blacks from being in the state. In 1849, the territorial government created another exclusion law, passing the forbidding of Blacks from settling in the newly declared territory. In 1857, voters approved a Black exclusion clause as a part of the proposed Oregon Constitution, and all that remained on the books until 1926. In February of 1859, Oregon as a state was admitted into the, into the Union with a constitution that excluded Blacks from having residency in the state. I'll take a second to pause here for any questions um, that you guys may have before we move on into our next segment. I, I actually do have a quick, uh, maybe a, just a clarifying question. I, I had heard about the, um, you know, I, I know about the exclusion laws and that um, slavery was, uh, was illegal, um, it, even as a, a territory. But it seems to me, and maybe maybe this is something you can confirm, that the slavery being illegal was not something that was done because slavery was considered to be a negative thing. It was done to keep blacks out of Oregon. Is that the case? Not exactly. So <clears throat> at that time, uh, the expanding country, uh, they did not necessarily want to add more slaveholding states to the Union. So it was kind of like, if you're going to be accepted into the union, you can't be a slaveholding state. And so the territorial government at the time was like, okay, well, we'll do that, but we'll also exclude blacks. So we don't have any blacks in the state so that slavery isn't necessarily an issue. However, what we're gonna find out in a, in a moment was that as white settlers moved west, they brought along their property, which included black people. Uh, and so what what happened was you had individuals that knew that Oregon was not a slaveholding state, but they considered uh, their Negroes property and they wanted to bring them along with them. And they brought them along and in some cases tried to keep them enslaved. So although Oregon had rules or laws uh, making slavery illegal, they weren't forcibly saying, hey, you know, this. Negro person, uh, uh, you have to give them their freedom. You know, it was just kind of on the books, but nobody was really enforcing it until uh, this family we're going to talk about in a moment actually challenged the law, you know, and, and set legal precedent uh, preventing slavery from actually occurring in the state of Oregon. So the law uh, making slavery illegal uh, wasn't designed to keep blacks out. It was really more designed to uh, accept the state into the union. Uh, but then they created exclusion laws preventing Blacks from being allowed into the state uh, for some reasons that were economic. You know, they didn't necessarily want to have to compete with the free labor of slaves. Um, also, because of racist overtones, you know, many of the whites that were moving west um, were coming from the Midwest or the South, um, and the perception of Negroes was just bad. Um, and so it was assumed um, that they wouldn't bring anything to contribute to the state that they would join in with the native Indians of the area and attack the white settlers. Uh, and so, you know, it was kind of like, we just don't want blacks here in general, whether it be politically or economically. 
Thanks. I, I also have another, this is more like more of a comment, but you can speak to it. Mm -hmm. um, this person says, it seems like Oregon banned slavery, but then implemented slavery as a practical matter by passing exclusion laws. Then blacks were allowed to remain as long as they acted like slaves. Yeah, I mean, there, there is some truth to that. You know, um, <clears throat> there were things that Blacks did, and, they, and in many instances, they kind of had to prove that they were notable um, and had integrity and should be accepted. Um, and so you have the instance of Abner Francis, um, who owned a, a, a shipping company, if you will, um, in the Portland area, uh, and they were trying to eliminate him from competing uh, economically with the white settlers. So they tried to use the exclusion laws to kick him out, uh, you know, and so it, in some ways, you know, there, there was economic uh, issues. Um, there was uh, classism kind of issues, you know, as to your point or the commenter's point, as long as blacks kind of acted a certain way, um, they could be in the state. Um, and then whenever it was inconvenient for the white settlers, uh, they would try to exclude them, you know, and so, you know, there, there's a. There's a lot of kind of overtones and and reasons why uh, they would maybe try to use the exclusion law um, or just kind of have negative perceptions as, as well that they didn't want to allow blacks into the state as a whole. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's just unfortunate uh, that it was the way that it was, but that's how it was, you know. And now we, you know, we talk about it. We try to understand it um, kind of looking forward. You know, it still plays a role into why there's such a low population of blacks in the state, even now. You know, uh, blacks only make up about 3% of the population here in Oregon, you know, and a lot of it still kind of comes from the fact that we weren't warmly welcome here um, in the very beginning. Um, and although there were laws preventing slavery from occurring, there were also laws preventing blacks from being comfortable within the state or the territory. Um, and so, although there's this uh, assumption that blacks were welcome, they really weren't. Uh, <clears throat> and so you can have laws that look like they're designed to protect blacks from being taken advantage of, but then you can also have laws excluding them from taking up residence, owning property, having businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is a question just from me, but I'm just wondering if you, maybe you'll talk about this later, but do you have any ideas of the numbers of uh, who were brought in? Uh, I I do not as a part of my presentation tonight. Uh, there are census laws, you know, that that kept track of Negroes in the state. Um, you know, several hundred uh, up to you know a, a, a thousand, you know, in the early 1900s. Uh, but there was never really a lot. It wasn't really until the 1940s. Um, and the expansion of the Union Pacific and South Pacific and the train, the railroad yard, um, that made passage from the South and East and Midwest, uh, to the West a little more convenient. You didn't have to come by covered wagon. And it also provided jobs, you know, um, that were acceptable for blacks. Um, so like as porters or, you know, cooks and servers, you know, things of that nature, nature, the more kind of domestic roles. Um, as more and more people kind of came west, there was a need for these more domestic roles. Um, and as more domestic roles were needed, it became more acceptable for blacks uh, to take up residence, uh, but kind of don't get too comfortable because we're still not going to let you own property or really move any beyond any kind of domestic role. Um, and so you had an increase, but not, it was only incremental and not a huge amount. So really it was only those that kind of came as wanderers. Those that showed up here as property, um, and then were able to, you know, find some sort of freedom, um, or escape, you know, from, uh, enslavement. Um, and even then, a lot of times you would find the blacks taking up residence in Washington or Northern California, uh, because they did not have those exclusion laws and they could own businesses and purchase property, um, in those places. And so there, there wasn't a whole lot of blacks that moved here in the, you know, during that Western migration, um, or even when uh, the railroad yards became more prominent. I hope that kind of answers your question. It does, thank you. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. Okay, so um, as you can kind of see from this map, you can see, uh, you know, what we would describe as the Oregon Trail. 
which started in about Independence, Missouri, uh, and traveled through. Um, at that time, you know, they weren't Nebraska, Wyoming, Idaho. Uh, they were just kind of Indian territories. Uh, but now we recognize them as, you know, these states. <clears throat> but uh, the conclusion of the journey ended in about o Oregon City. Um, and then sometimes individuals will come a little further south into the Willamette Valley and kind of get into um, a little bit of the watershed area. Um, and so there's a couple of stories that I'll tell you just about um, the Western ex expansion um, and how some Blacks came to Oregon during that time. <clears throat> so upon arrival in the new territory, Blacks had the same desires as anyone else that made the 2,000 mile journey to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Overcoming racism meant challenging those who opposed their desire. Uh, oh, screen is blocking what I'm reading. Okay. Overcoming racism meant challenging those who opposed their desire to pursue their life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And our next story speaks to those who overcame some of those challenges. So the first story that I'm going to talk to you about is the story of Rose Jackson. Uh, Rose came to Oregon in 1849 as a slave of Dr. William Allen. According to family lore, Allen knew about the exclusion law and decided not to bring Rose with them. However, Rose convinced the family to take her. And the family story is that she traveled in a wooden box with ventilation holes so that it wouldn't be known that a black was entering into the state. Rose was freed when they got to Oregon, but Dr. Allen died soon after they arrived. She is credited with helping the family survive the first winter by working as a laundress to bring money into the family. So here we have a situation where uh, some of those traveling west were aware of the exclusion laws of Oregon. Um, and in this particular instance, um, it discouraged Dr. Allen from bringing along Rose, but she you know, convinced him to bring her anyway. Um, and the family story says that they brought her in a box so that people would not know that she was traveling with the family. There were fears that other white uh, travelers uh, may want to harm her. Uh, there were fears that she may try to escape. Um, there was all sorts of worries and concerns. Uh -huh. Now, some of our some of our research into the family story didn't suggest that the entire time that they traveled on the Oregon Trail, she was inside of a box. But more than likely, she was able to come out in the evening when it was dark, or at times where maybe the family was alone um, and not a part of the regular uh, wagon train. But the fact of the matter is, she had to endure difficult hardships in order to make the journey, but she did make it. Here's a uh, photo of Rose and her son. Unfortunately, I don't have the son's name, um, but the fact that we have photos of her and the son um, are a testament uh, to the accuracy of the story um, and that she was a real person who traveled along the Oregon Trail and successfully made a home here in Oregon. Troy, I have to ask, uh, are these photos, um, do you get them from the, the descendants of the family members themselves or how do you get these photos? Uh, no. Uh, so... Uh, through our relationships with some of the other historical societies and organizations, um, you know, they share information uh, with us. Um, sometimes it is uh, just by research. Uh, there's the Oregon Historical Society, which is the largest historical society within the state. Um, you know, they tend to loan things to us and provide us things. There's some stuff that you can even search and Google online, but you kind of have to know what to look for, you know, in order to find it. Um, and so these are all photos um, that I, we were able to borrow or that I found online uh, in order to support the story um, and the presentation. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, when you go um, even to the High Desert Museum or specifically the Lynn Benton County Museum, um, they have a lot of photo photos, um, artifacts uh, and things, you know, that have been preserved and passed down. As far as our organization is concerned, uh, sometimes individuals will send us things that have been passed along um, as family heirlooms and artifacts in order for us to continue to tell the stories of these, you know, um, pioneers, these early Oregon Black pioneers. And so as our organization, you know, does presentations like this or we've done exhibits, 
um, in the Oregon Historical Society or help to set up exhibits in these other museums across the state, uh, people will reach out to us and say, hey, I have, you know, these documents, I have these photos, I have these artifacts, would you guys like them? Uh, and we collect them um, and we archive them and we share them or create exhibits um, or document them. Uh, we're currently working on a um, on an online museum um, that will highlight and document some of the artifacts and exhibits that we have. Um, and so, we, you know, we then get to say, hey, you know, XYZ family donated uh, these blankets or uh, this uh, this. Uh, I'm looking right at it in my mind, this saddle from a rodeo or a cowboy. Uh, Cause a lot of people don't like, there's so many stories, like not to tangent, but there's so many stories, you know, of individuals across the state who, you know, made major contribution. Um, and there's artifacts that are left over. Um, even in doing some of the research, I'll kind of jump ahead a little bit. Um, I found out that, uh, uh Louis Southward, um, who I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. There's a park being named after him. There's also a creek that's named after him. Um, we recently did uh, a naming. Uh, we try to do a lot of uh, more historically accurate naming, you know, to change the name. Um, recently, there was a, a mountain in Southern Oregon in the uh, Klamath Falls area that was referred to as Negro Bend Mountain. Um, and then we were able to successfully name it the Ben Johnson Mountain. Um, but it was, it was helpful for us to know, um, that it had the name Negro Ben so that we knew it was named after a black guy, you know, and so it's, you know, all of these kind of things help us to tell these stories and shape these narratives about individuals who made contributions to the state. Um, and so to get back to your question, you know, some of these, uh, pictures we do have and own, some we borrow from other organizations so that we can tell the stories and keep these narratives alive. Uh, the next story that I'm going to talk about um, is the Cora Cox story. Uh, originally born in Virginia, Cora Ann Cox was purchased in New Orleans in 1837 by Emmeline Carey, who married Samuel Johnson in 1850 in Missouri. They then immigrated to Oregon that same year, probably taking Cox with them. In 1852, the Johnsons were issued almost 640 acres of Brownsville land in their donation land claim. In the 1860 Lynn County Census, she is listed as a black slave under the Jefferson and Emmeline Huff household at age 32. At some point after 1852, Samuel died. And in 1859, Emmeline was remarried to Jefferson Huff. Emmeline then turned over 36.3 acres of the Johnson's land to Cox for faithful services rendered in 1864. This is most likely the time after which the house was built. Jefferson Hutt had his own slave named John from Tennessee. When Jefferson married Emmeline, this caused John and Cora to live together, and together they gave birth to two girls, Adeline and Angeline Cox. Neither of the children lived to the age of seven, however, and John died in 1875. Cora lived until 1891. During her time in her first house, she was a participant in many community events and left a monetary donation to the Willamette University's Women, Women's College in her will. What's interesting about this is that this house, Cora Cox's home, is still up and there in Brownsville. It's now been listed as a historical site and cannot be torn down. So you can still go and visit this house there in Brownsville. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want, there was something else that I wanted to share. I might not have it up and I don't want to ruin what I got going on, but um, you can still go and visit the Cora Cox home. Um, I mentioned a few moments ago about visiting the uh, Limbin and County Museum there in Brownsville. And they actually have an exhibit highlighting the Cora Cox story. And there's some more information that you can find out about it. And the Brownsville Museum is actually a really, a really cool place. Hold on, I wonder if I can uh, stop sharing for just a moment. 
I'm curious if I can uh, let you guys take a look at something just real quick. Uh, here we go. I'm doing too much. Here we go. So, uh, this is the Lane County Historical Museum. And I just wanted to take a moment to try to put it out there uh, for those that are interested to go and visit. It's a really cool place. Uh, they've converted some of the old South Pacific uh, rail cars as a part of the museum. Uh, this yellow one right here in the middle, that's the actual physical museum. And there's a lot of cool exhibits there. And we've been able to partner with them in order to help them highlight some of the stories of Oregon's early black pioneer. As I mentioned, they have like a living history um, uh, kind of weekend in August. Um, and so that you dress up in kind of the period clothing um, and share stories um, about individuals um, who lived during these periods. Um, they had, uh, when I went and set up shop in, uh, 2019, they had, um, uh, a camera that they used to take photos. They had games. They had clothing. They had like a doll making, um, kind of exercise. They used, uh, straw and hay, uh, to make dolls back in those days. And they had little doll clothes. Uh, they had the stick and hoop, uh, activity, you know, and so it, it really kind of brings alive uh, some of the history of the time and some of the stories as well. As I mentioned, um, there was a gentleman uh, by the name of Minor Jackson, a black barber who owned a business um, there in Brownsville. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't too far from where the museum is. The building is not there. The building burned down in a fire in the early 1900s, but it was in the general vicinity of where the, uh, the Brownsville Historical Museum is. Um, and so they they have some things that kind of look exactly like the period did at the time. And so I just wanted to kind of throw out there for those that, you know, live in the area to go and visit uh, because there's some really cool um, artifacts, exhibits um, and historical documents and things that you can get there um, that will really help to kind of bring alive some of the stories that we're talking about today. Um, they, they do have more information about the Cora Cox story. Um, there's also another um, a story, Amanda Gardner, that I'm not going to talk about tonight, but you can find out more about. Um, they have some information there about the Letitia Carson story um, that I'll kind of uh, play a video for in just a moment. But there's a lot of uh, good historical information that you can get there um, by visiting that museum. Okay. Um, and, and just an FYI, another participant just shared a link. And I guess if you, if you get to Albany, Democrat Herald, there's a recent article in there about a new marker, a historical marker to be placed honoring Reuben Shipley. Yes. Which I'm actually getting ready to talk about in just a, a moment. Oh, good. Good segue then. Yeah. Yeah. So. And we can share a link to that article if you want to uh, put that in. Um, Somehow, can you share that at all, Suzanne? I don't know if we can in this moment. I just put it in the chat, actually. Okay, okay. great. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so there's two stories that I'm gonna uh, kind of talk about, and then at the at the tail end, I'll play the video of the Letitia Carson story. But um, the uh, Holmes, well, the Ford Holmes case, which I was described legally, and then uh, Holmes. Shipley is the daughter of the Holmes family. We have a photo of her, uh, but we don't have a photo of her parents. So she, they're a part of this story. So the Holmes Ford case, which actually occurred in Lynn County, is the uh, legal precedent that officially banned slavery um, from happening in Oregon, uh, which is why it's important to have a historical marker to kind of highlight that. Uh, because without this case, I mean, we have the the law on the books that says slavery was illegal. But as I mentioned, and as this story you're about to hear is going to tell you, uh, white settlers showed up here with their property, which included black slaves. Uh, and, and there was still an expectation for them to either, uh, continue to 
worked and lived as a domestic slave, um, or um, in the case of the home Shipley story, the parents were freed, but the children were still held um, in slavery, um, and the parents, um, uh, the home, uh, Robin and Polly were their names, uh, sued, you know, Mr. Ford uh, for the freeing of their children. Um, and then after that, I'll talk about the Lewis Southward, uh, tell you a little bit about him. Um, but let me get into the, uh, the uh, Holmes Ford case. So this photo here is of Mary Jane Holmes Shipley. She's the um, top. Troy, hang on a sec. Uh, you're still sharing your screen with the museum. So I think you want to switch back over to your PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Let me see yeah. if I can uh, figure out what I did wrong here. Here, I'll do this. I'll do that. There you go. And I'll go to this. And then I'll go to that. And then, bada bam. Does that Perfect. work? Perfect. All right. I think what I did is I just moved from one thing to another, but the Zoom didn't keep up with me. So. Okay, so this is uh, a photo of Mary Jane Holmes Shipley. She is the daughter of Robin and Polly Holmes. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have any known photos of her parents, uh, but this is her. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, legal precedent case that formally abolished slavery or made it illegal to have slaves in the state of Oregon. As I mentioned in the introduction, when Oregon was uh, adopted as a state into the Union, a part of the Oregon Constitution uh, did make slavery illegal, but it also excluded uh, blacks from, from taking up residence in the state. And as it pertains to this particular case, as most white settlers did, they brought their belongings with them, um, which often included Negro slaves. Um, and so I'll read to you this story. Uh, in 1854, Polk County assessment rolls show the value of Robin Holmes' personal and total property. Robin and Polly Holmes arrived in Oregon in 1844 as the property of Nathaniel Ford. In their mid-30s at the time, they brought with them three of their six children. Their other three children were sold off as slaves in Missouri prior to them leaving. Before leaving Missouri, Ford promised Holmes' family their freedom upon arrival if they would help them establish a farm in the Oregon Territory. Settling in the Willamette Valley near Rickreall, Ford built a small cabin for the, the home, but he denied the family its promised freedom. By 1850, Robin and Polly had five children, and Ford granted them and their infant freedom, but kept their other four children as slaves. So remember, when they traveled to Oregon Trail, the Holmes family consisted of two adults and three children. By 1850, two more children were added to the Holmes family. The adults and the infant child were freed, but the four other children remained enslaved. Harriet, one of the children still held by Ford, died in 1851. Recognizing that Ford would not willingly free the surviving children, Robin began an unprecedented legal battle to gain custody of his children. Robin was up against formidable odds. He had lived his entire life as a slave and raised in slave culture. Bought and sold, he was also illiterate. He was bringing suit to an influential man with powerful connections who was also recently elected to the territorial legislature. Reuben Boise acted as Holmes' attorney. Boise later served as a delegate to the Oregon Constitution Convention in 1857. In 1852, however, Robin's attorney, Reuben P. Boyce, mounted a credible case against Ford. He filed a writ of habeas corpus in Second District Court in Polk County, seeking the return of Holmes' unlawfully detained children. The intent of the writ was to require Ford to bring the children to court and explain under what authority he was still holding them. If Ford failed to satisfy the court, he would likely be ordered to return the children to home, or so Holmes had hoped. According to the initial brief court record, Ford admits that he detained the children. 
The, cur the case worked its way through lower courts and finally reached the bench of Chief Justice George A. Williams of the Oregon Territory Supreme Court 15 months later. Williams ruled against Ford, who claimed that slavery could not exist in Oregon without special legislation to protect it. He then declared the home's children free. Following the ruling and with their rights to the children restored, Robin and Polly Holmes moved to Marion County where they operated a successful plant nursery. So here in lies the legal precedent and case that really made slavery illegal in the state of Oregon. As I mentioned, uh, Ford really planned on holding the Holmes family enslaved. It was never really his intent to, uh, to free them as he had promised when they made the journey from Missouri. Fortunately, uh, Robin was persevering um, and wanted his children and was willing to take on at that time what would seem like insurmountable odds um, as a Negro man who was illiterate and lived his whole life enslaved to sue a white man in court was unheard of and probably a court case that would have never been heard in the South. Fortunately, it was heard here in Oregon. And because they did have uh, laws making slavery illegal, the court upheld his suit. But as I mentioned, it had to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Fortunately, the judge hearing the case sided with Mr. Holmes and not Mr. Ford, setting legal precedent, making slavery truly illegal in the territory and ultimately in the state. However, that did not prevent people from trying to hold individuals enslaved in the state and in the territory. And so it's important to note uh, the perseverance of the individuals in this story uh, to try desperately to make sure that his family was free and not enslaved. And so we have this photo here of Robin, uh, excuse me, Mary Jane Holmes Shipley, uh, who was the daughter of Robin and Polly Holmes who was enslaved but free by that legal precedent case. I do have a picture of the Ford. And this is uh Mr. Ford and his wife, Nathaniel and Lucinda Ford. Our next story is of Lewis Alexander Southwood. Lewis Lou Alexander Southwood was born July 4th, 1830 in Tennessee. His father's name was Hunter. But since he was born into slavery, his surname was that of his master, James Southwood. In 1853, Lewis and his mother, Pauline, immigrated to Oregon with James Southwood. In biographical accounts, Lewis moved to Jacksonville and worked mining gold to earn money for buying his freedom. Information also suggests he fought in the Rogue River Indian Wars in Southern Oregon with Colonel John Kelsey's company of volunteers. The muster roll of Kelsey's 2nd Regiment does not include an entry for Southwood, so it appears he wasn't formally mustered in the member of the company. However, according to Charles H. Carey's General History of Oregon, Southwood was wounded during a skirmish in either March or April of 1856. Lewis moved to Wairika, California sometime around 1858 and made his livelihood playing the violin for local dancing schools, earning the $1,000 or 27,000 in today's dollars necessary to buy his freedom. After Lewis bought his freedom, James Southworth circulated a petition in Lane County to protect slave property. The petition made its way to the state legislature, but it was not adopted and Lewis was free from Southworth. What's interesting is the Robin and Polly, the Holmes Ford case, um, was settled about five years before this. So even though a legal precedent had been established at the time, there were still individuals trying to enslave others. Fortunately, uh, for Lewis Southworth, 
he was no longer a slave and was set free. In 1868, Lewis took up residence in Buena Vista, purchasing land and establishing a blacksmith shop and a livery stable. He married Mary Cooper in 1873. Mary had adopted a boy, Alvin McCleary, who was born in San Francisco of Jamaican parents. Taking advantage of the Homestead Act, which had no race restrictions, Lewis and his family moved to a homestead near Walport, where Lewis operated a school, I think it's pronounced, ferrying passengers and cargo across the Alcea River. During the summer, Southworth worked near Philomath and Corvallis, helping with the hay and wheat harvest to earn money for winter supplies. According to a 1932 article in Oregon Journal, Stepson Alvin reminisced, the 1917 death certificate of Louis Southwood. Lou had a good rifle and was a crack shot. He always had plenty of deer, elk, and bear meat, and there was plenty of salmon, trout, and clams and crabs here, so we lived well. Louis Southwood died on June 23, 1917 in Corvallis, Oregon, at the age of 86. He was survived by his second wife, Josephine Jackson, whom he married in 1913. His stepson, Alvin McCleary, continued to live and work in Lincoln County and eventually served as city councilman in Walport, Oregon. Um, in the city of Walport, uh, they're naming a uh, park after Lewis Southport. There's also uh, the Southport Stream or Creek uh, just outside of Walport as well. And I was kind of looking to see uh, if it was a part of your local watershed, and it's just outside. It, it, it travels through Lincoln County into Lane County, if I'm not mistaken. So I think it's a part of another watershed. But I thought that was kind of interesting. That was something I didn't even know. Um, but I was doing some more research, uh, you know, to find some specific stories that were in your county. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've done the Louis Southworth. Uh, story before, but I did not know that there was a creek named after him. I'll have to look on a map for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, well, I don't want to mess up again uh, with my share screen. <laughs> I did kind of look, you know, to kind of figure out where it was. Let me see if I can just uh, get it together. Because I did uh, uh, kind of look. Yeah, I don't know. How well this will kind of show up. Yeah, this might not work so well. So it says North Fork Althea River. The North Fork Althea River. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's somewhere in that in that region. I wish I was better at reading maps because I was trying my best. To kind of figure out where exactly it was and, and to try to get a little map, um, to kind of show where it was, but I'm not so good at, at mapping stuff. So. See, oh, I think we have a participant that is good at finding it on a map. So let me see if I can get that link into the chat. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, they were just able to find a map, I think, of Southworth Creek. Oh, okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, the, do you happen to know, Troy, when it was named after him? So, uh, I don't know when the creek was named after him. I believe it happened while he was still alive, uh, because it was the portion of the creek where he kind of ferried people back and forth, you know, across. Oh, sure. Uh, but this park that they're naming after him, I want to say the city of Walport, Within the last like year, um, you know, have been working to try to do it and kind of officially name this park after him. Um, because like I mentioned, I've done his story before and I didn't have the information. Uh, but when I was doing research for this particular presentation, I was able to find it. Um, and so I believe within the last year, like during the pandemic kind of COVID time is when they officially formally were going to name the park after him and make a plaque and do all of that good stuff. And so. Uh, and so, yeah, you can you can find it there if you just kind of look for Lewis Southwark, uh in uh, the Walport, Oregon area. Um, you can find where the park is. Cool. Thank you. And then um, one question I had was you had mentioned he had to earn all that money to buy his freedom. Did Correct. he still have to pay for that even though slavery was 
outlawed at the time. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Be, again, because, you know, those white settlers that were coming west brought along slaves as property. They were considered property. Um, and so even though, as, as I mentioned with the Rose Jackson story, Cora Cox story, uh, the Holmes Shipley uh, case, uh, you know, all of this stuff was known, but people didn't care. You know, they still brought them along because the expectation were that blacks were like these second class citizens and didn't like have the same rights uh, and protections um, that the white settlers did. And so uh, as it pertained to the, the Holmes uh, v. Ford case, they were promised their freedom when they arrived. When they arrived, they didn't get it. Um, ultimately, the parents were set free and the infant was set free. And I'm assuming the reason why the infant was set free is because the infant couldn't produce, you know, anything economically. It was it was a cost, a liability. I and mean, so it wasn't advantageous for the force to keep the infant, you know, uh, but they did keep the children because they could probably they probably had some skill and some value as slave labor. Um, and the same thing with Louis Southfield, you know, he was brought over as property um, and was still helping uh, the family that owned him, the Southfields, uh, to raise money. And so the things that he did to raise his own money, he used to purchase his freedom. And even at that point, uh, the Southridge still tried to keep him enslaved, you know, so much so that they made a claim thinking that legally they could still own him. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the legislature didn't uphold um, that claim to continue to keep Louis Southford enslaved, you know. And so uh, you, you have that. And in addition, um, you know, blacks couldn't own property, you know. Um, and so in, in many ways, they would often be reduced to still functioning um, as some sort of domestic worker, um, you know, or doing domestic work. That, that was all that people were accustomed to them doing. So even if they had other skills or wanted to pursue other things, you know, they really couldn't pursue uh, their entrepreneurial desires um, or home ownership claims. Um, or if they did, it was, uh, you know, t taking a tremendous risk. Um, in order to do so, you know, you could build up a home, you could build up a property, you could build up your business, um, and it could be taken away, you know, so they did it at tremendous risk, um, you know, so even for Lewis uh, Southford to have his homestead and to, you know, have that creek and have a business, it was probably only after he had shown that, you know, he was a, a, uh, a, a Negro with integrity um, and, and wouldn't turn against the white settlers of the space, uh, you know, and so it's, you know, these stories are really kind of interesting when you kind of really dig into some of the who, what, when, where's, and why's um, and try to siphon through even some of the retelling that may lend uh, favorably to the white settlers at the time. You know, it, you know, in, in the case of the Holmes Ford case, it was like, oh, you know, you had these white individuals who would take on the case and you had these kind of sympathetic individuals and stuff. And it's like, no, this is what they should have done. You know, um, and it was the right thing to do. Fortunately, they did the right thing, but a lot of people didn't. You know, and so it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, even in the Southford case uh, story, you know, there's a couple of different perspectives, you know, as to why he ultimately went to California. You know, uh, for some, he went there uh, because blacks were not excluded and he could have a job and work and earn money. Um, for some, it was because, uh, you know, the Southwards couldn't hold him as slave and enslaved, you know, and so it, it's kind of interesting, you know, some other stories are like, well, they took him there uh, because there were opportunities to find gold and mine. Um, and in the mining town, Louis Southford played the violin and can earn money, you know, entertaining the miners at the time. And so, there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things that you can kind of read into as to why things happened the way that they did. Um, ultimately, it lended to Lewis Southford gaining his freedom and being able to live an independent life on his own. Um, so now I kind of want to see if I can play this video um, of the. Uh, hold on one second. I'm going to play this video of. The Letitia Carson story. And I'm familiar with it and I know it, but I don't want to do it in injustice. I want the video to kind of tell the story itself. <clears throat> uh, it's about 
10 minutes. Um, and it, and it, it, it's a period kind of story. Um, and so, uh, the, the woman playing the character of Letitia Carson, she's like sharing the story to her granddaughter about her life. Um, and it's kind of set in the period of time. So, so just be mindful of that. Okay.
and they didn't realize that I was just as much a woman as they were. And so uh, sometimes they didn't want to talk to me or they didn't want me to be with them. And uh, most times I just went in and did what I did because uh, you can't make nobody like it. You can just do what you do. What did you do after the Lincoln Trail? Well, we did as much work after the trail as we did on the trail because then we had to start all over. <coughs> So we ended up in a little area outside of Corvallis, Oregon, and it was called Soap Creek. It's like soap, like you wash up with in, in, in a creek. I don't know where the name comes from, but Soap Creek. And uh, we looked around and we looked around and finally, your grandfather found this beautiful uh, land. It's 640 acres, and uh, it was just the most beautiful thing. You couldn't look at, stand on one side and to the other side. I'd never seen that much land in one spot, but because we were not legally married, so you could only have 320 acres per person. Why? Right. Um, well, at that time, uh, colored folk and white folk could not get married. Your Uncle Jack, now he was born in 1849. That's the same year that the exclusion laws was put into place. Hmm. What is the exclusion law? Well, baby, exclusion laws is basically said that certain people could not live in the territory. And so um, there was exclusion laws that excluded the colored. However, we was already here before they became a territory. And so we did not have to leave. And your grandfather took us ill. And, uh, and we lost him that year, and uh, things got got really bad. This man named uh, Greenberry Smith, he just he had to have our land. Uh, he took everything out from up under us. Uh, it was me and your, your mama and your Uncle Jack. And he just came in, and he took the land and the house. He, he sold things he didn't even want. He sold furniture. He sold plates. He sold your granddaddy's underwear that I had made with my hand. He sold the red things on the way. Yes, he did. Now, you know, that just ain't right. Uh, as we were leaving, I had to give him $100 to buy some of my own things back because he had taken it all like it was his. And so I gave him $100 and I bought some of my plates and pots and things back and bought my bed so we could all sleep in something and, uh, you know, got my cows so I could still make some money with my milk and cheese. I was really going to need it then. But then some, at some point, uh, after hearing things over here and hearing things over there, I, I realized I could go to court about what Mr. Smith did. And so I did. I filed two lawsuits, two. Because one time, one thing he was saying was that I wasn't Mr. Carlton's wife. And I said, well, if I wasn't his wife, then I must have been his worker because I sure was doing a lot of work and I sure didn't get no pay for it. And so I sued for my pay. And then I said, but even if I wasn't his wife or his worker, then there was my cow. And so I wanted money for my cow. And uh, we brought in uh, some people, came in and testified on my behalf. That means you stand up and you tell what you know. And so people who knew us from Missouri and who knew us on the trail and who knew us in Oregon, they all came and they stood in front of the judge and they said, yes, yes, that was that was uh, uh, her cow, and yes, she made butter and cheese, and yes, she built the house, and yes, and they just, yes, and yes, and yes, and finally the judge said, well, this must be true, and so I won both of those lawsuits, and so I got money back for them cows that that, that man stole from us, and I got money back as if I had been Mr. your grandfather's employee, and so I had almost $2,000 for us. <laughs> that was a lot of money. So then, not long after I won the, the case and had a little bit of money, then there was something called the Homestead Act. And the Homestead Act basically said if you live someplace for five years and you tended that someplace for five years, then that someplace become yours. So we moved on that property and we put up this little house we're sitting in right here. And we put 
put out that orchard that's out there on the trees? Yes, we did. Your mama and your, and your uncle. And we planted and we worked and now we have our own. And can't nobody take it. You know what? My name is on it. It's the Letitia Carson. That's my name. And they can't take it because it's ours. It's going to be ours. Can't nobody steal it. You think about that? The mercy. I think you're remarkable. <laughs> and I go to bed. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so there you have the Letitia Carson story, which to me is one of the more remarkable stories uh, that uh, I like to share uh, because, again, it just shows such great perseverance. And a willingness to try something that in other circumstances probably would not have been tried. Uh, you know, kind of as they're doing that reenactment there, you know, she said, hey, I, I heard some things from some people and I heard some things from some people and I decided to give it a try. You know, which, you know, again, just uh, speaks to a remarkable perseverance um, for her. And in the same way, the Holm Shipley case or even for Lewis Alfred you know, for people to kind of fight for their own liberty and life and, and pursue the dreams and goals that they have for themselves. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm thankful to be a part of this organization to share these stories um, and, to, and to hear about them myself. Um, I like to say I'm a native uh, Oregonian. I was born and raised in Portland, graduated from high school here, attended Oregon State University, graduated from Eastern Oregon University. And so I'm a, a web foot, you know, through and through. Um, but a lot of these stories I did not know, you know, and when I joined the organization, and I began to learn more and more about some of these stories. It made me really feel like an Oregonian, uh, you know, uh, for a lot of uh, blacks that live here currently. Um, there's still this feeling of uh, of exclusion. Um, but as I learn these stories and come to realize that we make up the fabric of the state, you know, since before it was a state, we've been here. And as you heard from the Letitia Carson story, uh, their family was here when it was just a territory. Um, and so you can't really have the state of Oregon um, without uh, the contributions that African-Americans, Blacks, uh, Negroes, you know, whichever term we were designated as at the time, uh, the contributions that we made to make Oregon what it is. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm thankful to be able to share um, all of these stories. The last kind of thing that I'll say, uh, the history of Blacks in Oregon start before statehood and encompass almost every aspect of its existence. We touch every corner of the state and are part of the fabric of its greatness. There's actually a little map that I want to share um, as a part of the, the final slide of my slideshow here. Um, <clears throat> we touch every corner of the state and are a part of the fabric of its greatness. There are many more stories to be told, but this is just a glimpse into the contributions we've made over the decades, and even centuries at this point. There is so much more to our story, and with each story I learn, it brings about a pride in being Black in Oregon. I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation, and I hope that you are inspired to learn more about the history of Blacks in the area, and that our existence cannot be overlooked if you tell the truth about this region. So there's not a place um, that we haven't touched, that there isn't a story, that there isn't uh, something that we did to contribute to the fabric of the state of Oregon. Um, and so I hope that, you know, those that are watching, those that will watch, those that are listening, um, you take an opportunity uh, to learn more about the history. Um, and I like to say that this is not just Black history, this is Oregon history um, that tells a story about Blacks in this state. And so I hope that you, you know, take some time to learn more, go and visit a couple of the places that I mentioned, the High Desert Museum um, or the uh, Lynn Benton County Museum there in Brownsville. Um, the Oregon Historical uh, Society uh, typically does have some great exhibits, um, make a contribution to Oregon Black Pioneers. As I mentioned, we're going to uh, have a virtual museum, um, hopefully in the next 18 months. Um, where we have exhibits, archives, stories, you know, videos, all sorts of things uh, that highlight more of the contributions that Blacks have made in the state of Oregon. Well, thank you so much, Troy. Uh, the stories are are fascinating. They're incredible, and the, to hear that 
this as if it's something new is just it's a it's a little heartbreaking and i'm wondering um what the oregon black pioneers if they're if they have a um an avenue to reach out to schools or how 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 does this get more told how do these stories get more told great question great question so we're currently working on trying to create curriculum um, and some pilot programs with the hopes that we can uh, include this as more a part of Oregon history. Um, you know, and so, you know, I kind of made the point a moment ago that this isn't just Black history and isn't uh, confined, if you will, to February, which is uh, African American History Month. Uh, but this is a part of the state's history. Um, and so our goal is to try to create curriculum to highlight these stories, uh, to talk about the contributions um, that, you know, encompass the state. You know, as I mentioned, you know, I grew up uh, I'm kind of dating myself here, but the Apple IIe computers with the green screen playing Oregon Trail on the floppy disk. And in my mind, I never imagined that Blacks were a part of that, you know, a part of the wagon train, you know, but they were, you know, and we have documented stories to highlight that. And, and, and even York being a part of Lewis and Clark expedition and fundamentally ensuring that the expedition was a success without his participation, they just, they probably wouldn't have been able to do it, you know? Um, and I didn't know that either, you know? And so uh, it, 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 it's more about telling the entire story as opposed to a portion of the story. And, and us creating the curriculum um, that includes these forgotten pieces of the story, uh, you know, and, and trying to make that as much a part of the Oregon history uh, rather than, you know, here's kind of a subsection of the Oregon history. Um, and so that's kind of what we're working on. You know, having having the uh, online museum will certainly help to do that. Uh, but in addition to that, we're trying to work to create this curriculum. Um, you know, and, and, and have some pilot programs to, you know, kind of test it out, see how it works, see how it's received, see what tweaks need to be made. Um, and then, you know, ultimately making a proposal to, um, either the Portland Public School District, uh, which is the largest school district in the state or to the Oregon Department of Education. Well, I, I know we're getting down to eight o'clock here, but I want to invite, um, there's still time for a couple questions. If anybody has, you know, one or two questions to put up there in the Q&A, please feel free to go ahead and do that. And in the meantime, I think I want to put your um, Oregon Black Pioneers website in the chat so everyone yes, can thank you. Thank that you. Up. And that's Oregon Black Pioneers. Dot org. Org. Mm -hmm. There we go. And there's, there's videos and things on the Oregon Black Pioneers uh, website as well um, that you can, you know, watch, read about. Uh, you know, it's. I mean, I sometimes not simply because I'm a part of the organization, but you know, I'm I'm a student at heart. My day job is a preschool teacher, uh, and so I'm always learning. You know, I love to read and learn. Uh, we have two books um, that highlight it. Uh, just before we got started, I went to try to go grab them, but I couldn't readily find them. A peculiar Paradise. I read a, a, a excerpt um, in my introduction, um, and there's also a book called Perseverance um, that highlights some of these stories, um, and 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 they're worth reading. There there there's just so much information um, that you can find. Um, there's pictures and photographs, documents um, that really just how kind of bring it to life and make it more real. Um, and so I encourage you to go to the um, uh, OregonBlackPioneers.org, uh, make a donation. It would help too. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Troy, and thank you everyone for participating tonight and listening. And I want to mention that this has been recorded and we will make this presentation available on our website. And um, yeah, and you'll everyone who participates tonight or has who has registered for this uh, presentation will get that email when it's ready um, and available for your viewing and for sharing as well. Um, so once again, thank you so much, uh, Troy. Thank you and Kendra. Thank you for for your assistance with the Q and A, uh, and and 
stay tuned for our final Sips of Science of the winter coming in January. It's going to also be about a uh, history of the Lucky Newt watershed um, with splash damming and the timber industry. So um, stay tuned for that. Uh, that more information is on our website. And as the thank yous come rolling in, I don't know if you can see that, Troy. We have yeah, and I've seen a couple of them come in. You guys are very welcome. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Uh, we're always looking for opportunities to, to share more um, information, stories. And so if there's more that you want to uh, learn, just reach out and we'll provide what we can. Fantastic. Well, good night, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> All right. Hey, Kendall. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye. Have a great day, you guys. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone.